But what we wanted to do in this panel session was to sort of get out into the real world, get away from the research, but, you know, what, what are the consequences of, you know, the issues that, that we are researching? So we've got, uh, we've got three excellent panelists, as you can see, this afternoon. Uh, first of all, Georgina Hammerton. Uh, Georgina is Senior Project Manager at the Social In Innovation Partnership. Uh, and I don't know anything about that at all, so I'm going to ask you to give us a quick overview about it before we start. Uh, we have next, we've got Lucy Parkin. Uh, Lucy, I do know well, who uh, co-founder of Clean Bus, uh, but you're also director of ESG, and I don't really know what that is, so you're going to tell us about that. And then finally, we've got uh, stepped into the breach, thank you very much, Simon Burkett, who runs Clean Air for London. So uh, let's start. Uh, Georgina, can you tell us about the, uh, the Social Innovation Partnership? Yeah, I can do. Just checking how loud that was going to be before I started speaking. Um, and I feel like I'm quite sad that John's not here because I absolutely love to be able to grill someone that works at a council. Um, <laughs> that's why he's not here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my name's Georgina. I work at the Social Innovation Partnership. We are quite a small social impact consultancy based in London. Um, most of the work that I do is community engagement. I do a lot of impact evaluation, process evaluations in the social space. Um, and I'm currently working with Andrew and Kayla on Breathe London, um, which, as you've heard, is an amazing kind of innovative community-based um, pan-London project. So happy to speak about anything. Um, I do a lot of work across different sectors, um, so the Vogue sector, um, regeneration housing, and I think a lot of the learnings that we do are quite kind of applicable to a variety of engagement styles. Thank you. Lucy. Hi. Actually, I think I want to grill Georgina. That sounds fascinating. Um, yeah, I'm Lucy. Um, I'll be familiar to lots of you here um, from an air quality background. I can't quite claim 30 years, but at least 25 years ago, I had my hands on a chemical analyzer. I can no longer say it. Um, but yeah, in my current role, um, I am co-founder of an impact-driven startup called Clean Bus. Um, Clean Bus, we've established to take the diesel engines out of in-service legacy buses and replace them with electric drivetrains um, and a whole load of batteries um, and get them back out on the road as quickly as we can. Um, we really see this as a sort of solution that's got obvious environmental benefits but also social benefits um, in terms of keeping a public transport system moving and accelerating towards electrification. Um, director of ESG means I am interested in all things zero emission buses and what impact we can have um, and also collaborating with government, local authorities, bus operators, everybody who will speak to me um, about how we can accelerate this transition and capitalise on the benefits. Um, but also as director of ESG, it's my responsibility to keep the company on um, straight and narrow with regard to our own impacts and do what we can to develop in the most sort of environmentally and socially sustainable way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my new hat in a nutshell. Thanks. I'm sure we'll delve more into that in due course. Simon. Uh, Simon Burkett, uh, founder and director of Cleaner in London. I set up a campaign uh, in 2006 to achieve full compliance throughout London with the WHO air quality guidelines. Uh, we just about achieved that in 2021 when the WHO slashed their guidelines. So uh, I've got about another 15 years worth of work, I think. Um, <laughs> Uh, but one of the very first conversations I had when I got started was with Gary, who um, uh, told me um, or explained to me about the um, air quality um, monitoring network, uh, which really is the um, uh, sort of bedrock um, and has been the bedrock for, for all the work I've done. So I'm actually a very big fan of um, uh, what this team does. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. So I'm going to open it up to the audience, but before I do that, I'm just going to ask them each one question. But so get your questions ready. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, to learn more about what these various uh, people are doing. Georgina, you have to deal, I'm sure, with lots of challenges with you know, working with different communities. But you know, today we're talking about air pollution. So how does that sort of rank within all the other things that you you know, you're, you have to address. Cool, thank you. I've just realised that I've met Simon before, actually. 
um, which kind of fits well into the question that you asked, because a couple of years ago, and maybe you remember, um, it was a while ago, but we did a research project that specifically looked at um, why certain voices are more prevalent within the air pollution agenda than others. Um, so normally people that look a bit more like us, um, I think, and we had you along as a guest speaker um, at, on one kind of one of our kind of cohort building panels, um, and it was amazing. So thank you. Um, but I guess that's that's really kind of something to think about in terms of with every kind of agenda and every space that we work in. Often one of the most important things to do at the beginning is think about actually the voices that are involved and the way that they're shaping conversation at that moment. Um, and that tends to lead you to thinking about okay, so what's being missed out? Um, what are the things that aren't being spoken about and why? So specifically within the air pollution agenda, and it's something that we've, we've spoken about time and time again within the Breathe London project, is what are the barriers that are getting people to, to being engaged? Um, what are the different things that people think about when they start to think about air pollution? Is it capacity? Is it time? Is it the language being used? Is it the fact that they don't feel invited to the table? When they are invited to the table, um, do they feel like their views are really being heard and valued and listened to? Or do they feel like they're being extracted? And that's something that we have to think about a lot when we when we speak about things like storytelling. Um, often, when we when we kind of have research projects and listen to people's views, um, you'll often find kind of people go away. They take people's opinions and they're not often fed back into the wider conversation. Yeah. So that's definitely important. It probably is applicable to different things, but definitely within air pollution, I think it really resonates. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. What you do, your company, you take old, dirty diesel driven buses and you replace the diesel engine with a nice new electric clean one. Who pays for that? I can't see anything wrong with that. Why don't we do more of it? Who pays for it? Um, yeah, so uh, a new electric bus, new zero emission bus is about 500,000 at the moment. So a repair solution should be about a third of that. Um, so the, the operator could fund that from future savings of the reduced maintenance and operation of a zero emission bus versus a diesel bus. Um, but there's other solutions in terms of who might be funding that bus. It might not be the operator that owns that bus. It could be um, it's unlikely to be the, but the local authority, but there's also the organisations that all own the fleets and then rent them back to the operator. So it's an incredibly complex system financially, but the, ultimately it's a third of the cost of a new bus. It can be done much quicker. There's not long lead times. Um, <clears throat> so we're working with all the different partners to try and work out a funding solution for the individuals as we go along and try and sort of release some of those operational savings to um, release the capital to fund the repair. So, yeah, I work with some brilliant financial people, so that, that's definitely their game. But, um, yeah, the, 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 it makes so much sense on paper. It's just about trying to realise that in each individual situation, and it's such a disparate market. But what we know is the bus industry are really struggling, and there's a massive appetite from operators across the board to move over to zero emission. Um, it's a simpler solution. You know, it's nicer for them. It's nicer for their passengers. There's obvious health and environmental and social benefits to it. Um, and we just want to be able to help them do that um, as quickly as possible. Mm. Right, thank you. Simon, you've been in this game nearly as long as we have. Uh, <laughs> Half as long. Looking, just looking back and coming to where we are today, do you think things have changed substantially or do you think that we're still beating our heads against the brick wall? Uh, it basically, to me, the really tipping point year was the Olympic year. Um, at the start of that year, there were really three of us campaigning on air quality in terms of campaigning as opposed to the scientific work. Uh, there was myself, uh, Jenny Bates from Friends of the Earth, uh, and Alan Andrews at Client Earth. Uh, but by the end of 2012, there were about 20 um, NGOs who were campaigning on the subject. So that was really the uh, uh, big change to me, uh, and that's in part because um, as a campaigner, it was just a fantastic opportunity. Uh, we knew that the Olympics was coming. We knew that there were big air pollution problems in London, so we had them between a rock and a hard place. Um, and the combination of various things, uh, so legal action by client earth, uh, I published uh, through an FOI request to TFL. Um, Lucy was one of the 
for people who received many requests. <laughs> yeah, um, Lucy but, used to uh, work for TfL uh, and the but, GLA. <laughs> um, but you know, I published um, uh, a spreadsheet showing 1,100 schools within 150 metres of roads carrying over 10,000 vehicles a day. Um, I asked TfL for um, every regulated pollutant on each one of 41,000 road links in London, which was about a million and a half pieces of data. Um, published that, which meant that people could look outside their house, outside their office, uh, and get exactly what the picture was. Uh, and so those sorts of things are a mixture of sort of legal um, pressure, um, infraction action by the European Commission, which of course, um, well not of course, but I happen to miss, miss a lot. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, uh, and then also uh, providing information for people. Um, and uh, in 2011, uh, I, um, uh, I encouraged, um, I've, I've spent, um, ev I've tried to forecast every air pollution episode since uh, 2008 in London. Uh, and in 2011, um, in April, I encouraged um, Jenny Jones, who is who's now the, the Baroness, the, the peer, but I encouraged her to put out a high ozone air pollution uh, warning. It happened to coincide exactly the same day. It was the Thursday before Easter. It happened to coincide with the first legal breach, the 36th day of the um, PM 2.5 um, limit. Um, and uh, having she having put one out, um, forced Boris to put one out. Um, and and um, that's a different story. We can talk about Boris. Um, uh, and uh, that then forced DEFRA to put one out. Uh, I then did seven TV interviews in 24 hours, and DEFRA, to my knowledge, hasn't sent a press release um, to journalists or weather desks um, since uh, 20th of April 2011, um, uh, and I think that's a great pity. So um, uh, one of the things that I'm doing with the Healthy Air Coalition uh, is encouraging um, uh, more uh, and better warnings um, about um, uh, air pollution episodes um, still after the 15 years. Uh, there's also quite a lot on the cleanair.london website. But I think it's about sort of pressure, encouragement, um, you know, encouraging mayors to go further, which I have kept doing consistently under different mayors. Uh, and when they do um, take a step, it's quite often um, you know, appreciated when you're out there saying, look, um, it is good to see this, but they still need to go further. Uh, and the new WHO guidelines um, do set um, some really um, uh, great um, uh, benchmarks, uh, very clear mm. benchmarks. Um, and to me, the next one uh, is really 20 for NO2, um, uh, for nitrogen dioxide, and of course the, the five uh, for PM 2.5. But the European Commission's approach is quite similar to uh, the approach in the Clean Air Human Rights Bill, which um, Jenny Jones has um, taken through the House of Lords, uh, which is um, uh, uh, an interim target and then um, full compliance with the new WHO guidelines, uh, as we've heard earlier, by 2035. So yeah. it's a mixture of lots of things. Okay, thank you for that. So what we want now is, you know, interesting questions coming from the audience. Uh, these are three great people here that we've got. So let's have a microphone up here. Thank you. I'm really glad that all the panelists are here. I have a question for, really for all of them. Um, we've spoken about uh, today about air quality in great depth. Uh, and now talking about the depths of London, I'm really concerned as a resident in London on using the underground and the PM levels uh, in the London Underground, and what's being done about that? I mean, I wish Sadiq Khan were here. What's being done about that, about cleaning up the air there? Um, yeah. um, thank you. Uh, if you go to cleanair.london and type in tube dust, uh, I've published quite a lot of stuff there over the last 10 years or more. Um, uh, it is a problem. Uh, I haven't seen um, the latest sort of annual data which shows what the um, particle levels are on different lines. Um, but in general, um, it is much better to be traveling on the, um, uh, the surface line, so district and circle if you possibly can, 
uh, I was on the Vic Victoria line the other day and um, it really it sort of felt hot and actually fairly unpleasant. So it is, it is a problem. Uh, there was um, uh, a tunnel cleaning train um, which was explored, so you can again find that on the, the cleanair.london website. Uh, but I understand that it was pulling asbestos, um, uh, the part, when it was being piloted it was pulling asbestos out of the tunnel walls, so they weren't able to go ahead with that. Uh, but they do put crews down there which um, don't disturb the asbestos um, and they very carefully, as best they can, um, uh, clean the tube network. Uh, I think it is uh, cleaner than it was, uh, but it is better to stick, I, personally, I think, to those higher, um, you know, closer to surface lines, if you possibly can. That's clearly not, not possible, um, but I would like to see more warnings about you know, for people um, about uh, what it's like on the tube. So we do a lot of work in this area, and I'm sure you've heard us talk about this before. The, the dust down there is totally different from the dust above ground, uh, and we, don't, we just haven't had the research undertaken to demonstrate that it is, it is as harmful as, as uh, PM above ground. So I suspect it probably is, but we haven't got the evidence. And until we've got the evidence, I think we've got to be a little bit careful because we certainly don't want to scare the public if, if, we're, if we're incorrect about that. Other questions? This gentleman here. Thank you. Well, I, I was involved over 40 years ago initially with um, uh, emissions analysis of boiler, big, big steam boiler plant and um, incinerators and so on. And it's great to, and we used to hunk around big lab based equipment, <laughs> infrared analyzers and all this sort of stuff. So it's great to see the, the various um, uh, new continuous monitoring uh, equipment and so on. But one thing they do, they, I see they're doing NOx, uh, particulates and so on. When I get my car MOT'd, one of the things they do is an emissions analysis of it, and they do various things, including hydrocarbons and um, CO. Is there anything being done on that? Yes. Yeah, there is. Where's, where's Dave? Can you take the microphone up to Dave? Because I, sorry, because obviously it's a technical question. CO is very low outside, isn't it? Yeah, CO is not, not, well, it's still measured in some locations and we do still measure it. It's not as of concern because since uh, catalytic converters, we don't see quite so much of it. Um, hydrocarbons are measured at, I think, two or three stations around London. Uh, it's quite an expensive way of, or in real time at two or three stations. It's quite expensive to do, um, but we are doing it. And is it a problem? Um, all of the 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 one the hydrocarbons that that are that have limit values associated with them from health, we're below all of those. Okay. Question made right at the back. Thank you, Carl, Kayla. So it's it's been a really good day, I think, seeing the links between monitoring understanding the impacts of pollution and then at the end of the day looking at how that feeds into regulation and driving change at the kind of the government level and the level of a lot of people in this building and we've also heard about reaching out to communities but right at the start I think it was either Gary or Ben said you know we've done all the easy stuff and uh, <laughs> it hasn't been that easy and I uh, think you know the the, the recent ULES um the, the final expansion of the ULEDs has been very, very telling, actually, in a coalition of interest in change that has started to fracture and at least fray at the edges. And I think if we really accept that we've done all the easy stuff, but there's still a lot of hard stuff to do, I think my question is how do we as like dyed in the wool professionals in our little niche bit of air quality actually build and bring along those coalitions for change so people don't feel like change is being done to them that it's being done by them georgina to start with because i think community's central to this isn't it yeah and i think that that's kind of the last the last kind of phrase that you used which was by and for essentially um 
And I mean, the best way to do that is going right back to what Kayla was speaking around in terms of participatory research, participatory design and co-design. Um, and again, it'd be great if John was here because I know that councils are trying to do this a lot more by having communities kind of engaged right in the early planning stages, specifically in things like neighbourhood planning um, or kind of climate policy, then we can really see people's concerns being raised at the beginning and they're taken on a journey. Um, that gives community ownership. So feeling like you own something from start to end makes it much more of a sustainable and legacy-driven um, programme or policy. There's great things that are happening. Um, I've done a recent piece of work for the GLA around community engagement. There's so many great things happening out there. Um, things like urban rooms. I don't know if people have kind of heard of those. They're happening a lot in the southwest in Kingston and places like that, um, where community members are number one. Um, remunerated for their time so that's a kind of a big thing and it's something that actually I know that often gets cut in budgets but giving people remuneration makes it that they can prioritize community engagement over other aspects of work that really brings in money for them that's really important um, for people from marginalized communities especially in the cost of living crisis so ensuring that these kind of things are really thought through and that it's prioritized community engagement is often not prioritised, it's project-based rather than actually embedded within specific organisations, structures and processes. Um, yeah, I've gone around in a circle, but I think essentially what you said is it. It's by and for, and it's not for. Um, a big tricky thing in engagement, and I hear it all the time from funders, is that when they put out calls for community engagement, people want to speak about housing. People want to speak about things that are really immediate to them. Um, environment is quite tricky to engage people in because it feels, it feels kind of longer term, doesn't it? It doesn't feel as short term or as kind of immediately impacting them in the communities. But the messaging and the language and things like that, if it's tailored and culturally appropriate, then it can feel much more like an immediate concern and something that people want to become engaged with. My own feeling is that we actually didn't engage, we didn't get the communities to engage enough with the ULES uh, situation. So there, there's a lot of people out there who could have spoken to you know, their, their neighbours and their colleagues in a way that we as researchers can't. Uh, and I think maybe if we think that one through again, we should, we should have had the, the GLA, TFL doing a lot more of that. I agree, same as the LTMs. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I think um, you know we need, you know, with big problems, uh, we do have a big air pollution problem in London. We need big solutions. Uh, I think uh, you know I was very involved in the um, the ULES um, uh, you know expansion. Um, I was quoted in over three hundred articles in nineteen countries. I think um, you know at that time, um, I think you know, there was a lot of. Um, uh, you know, or, or a lack of information, uh, a lack of understanding, lack of understanding, I would say. Um, uh, you know, basically the ULES expansion is the ninth phase of low emission zones in London. Um, only 5,386 diesel cars were first registered in the whole of London out of nearly 9 million people in 2022, just over 5,000 diesel cars. That's down by over 90% from the peak in 2015-16. 346,000 people will go from uh, above 20 micrograms per cubic metre of NO2 to below. I mean, these are really big benefits. Uh, and I can tell you as somebody who sort of lived through and watched the monitors for NO2 in Brompton Road, um, the fact that NO2 has gone down by two thirds over the last 15 years, you can actually smell that the air is cleaner. Um, and, and I think, you know, just recently we've had 20 mile an hour speed limit um, introduced uh, on Brompton Road and Cromwell Road. I mean, it's an awful lot quieter, just almost overnight. So, you know, there are some really big benefits from these things, some which happen quickly, some which happen over time. Uh, but I think giving people the right information uh, and building understanding of what we're doing and why, to me, that's the key. And it is a mixture of technology, uh, but also what I call um, you know, lifestyle change, which I don't mean sticking electrodes on your head. What I'm talking about is a mixture of sort of bans, charges, campaigns to build public understanding, incentives and adoption. So it's a sort of spectrum of the non-technology things. Uh, mm. We need all of those, but I'd be very interested to know what, what Lucy thinks. 
Thank you. Uh, well, yes, specifically on ULES, I, I was involved in the very early days in the, with the central London ULES. Um, <clears throat> obviously, beyond that, it escalated to impact a lot more people um, with a lot more benefits, um, but also a lot more behaviour changes that had to take place. Um, I'd agree totally that it was, it's, it's communication about um, the, you know, the benefits and, um, and making sure that everybody's on board with that. And actually, Simon remarkable job back in 2012 and kind of getting you know getting that ball rolling um when we were all trying to push it along in the, in the tfl and gla um but on a sort of from an industry perspective because this is where i now find myself um on a sort of collaborative point of view what i've sort of reflected on today is that i'm very lucky to be in this industry of air quality um and have the background that I've got in terms of understanding the impact. Um, but now in this world of sort of impact-driven startups, I'm meeting so many amazing entrepreneurs and people who are driven from, you know, all sorts of backgrounds, but they really want to make a difference. They're really trying very hard. Um, and I think um, as an industry, air quality industry, um, we need to bear them in mind as well as stakeholders because really there's a great potential there and there's some brilliant things going on, um, but there's not necessarily the scientific understanding about the right direction to go in or indeed what impact they might be able to achieve. So I think, and it, I mean, it all comes back to public awareness as well. We, we need, as, as a startup industry, we need the public to be on board. We need the government support to get um, scale up funding um, and that all helps and it all comes comes from sort of within air quality and our industry. So, yeah, just we're part of a breathable cities cohort, um, which is 10 startups that are making an impact on air quality that um, is funded by impact on urban health and um, St Guy's and St Thomas's, which is absolutely fantastic. It's been a brilliant resource and it so it just brings, you know, 10 startups that are all driven to make the same impact together um, and, and programmes like that. And I think as an air quality industry, like the more we can do there, the more we can capitalise on those, those people out there that are also trying to do what we're trying to do. Great. Kayla? Um, Lucy, uh, I'm not sure what stage clean bus as a startup is is at but I was curious what your approach is or, or will be for outer boroughs where public transportation options are are fewer you know I'm curious about your focus on transitioning vehicles um, and buses but having worked in Barking and Dagenham I mean it's it's incredible it's incredible it takes so long to get so far there are not public transportation options and you know, personal vehicle use is, is incredibly high. Um, have you thought about how, like, how you would add other lines or, or I mean, work with, within your experience from TFL? I mean, I'm sure you have really, really deep knowledge about the whole dynamics um, with respect to kind of adding lines and, and um, amplifying opportunities for public transport. I mean, fundamentally, from my perspective now, we're trying to save the industry money. Um, the, and it will be down to the individual operators and the local authorities to um, dictate which lines, um, you know, the greater level of service. But hopefully what we're offering is a resource where they can save operational costs and roll out greater public transport. Um, I'm very aware of this sort of disjoint between the fact that private transport is you know, people are buying electric cars left right and centre um, people with off street parking and access to charging very lucky people um, and we're asking a whole sector of society to get on a diesel bus um, and we probably also Rishi Sunak has pushed back the date of um, ending the sale of non-zero emission cars by five years with buses and coaches they consulted 18 months ago and still haven't announced the outcome of that consultation so we're still waiting to hear it it was meant to be between 2025 and 2032 um, but your average car lasts for nine years your average bus is sort of 15 20 25 years um, and it's you know school buses are some of the oldest um, so we're looking at a sort of 2050 scenario where people are still having to get diesel buses, which just has this you know, massive disjoint in my mind. Um, so they are, that's our motivation, to try and help the industry, to try and provide a zero emission public transport solution. Um, whether that will increase in service, I mean, hopefully it will at least protect services um, if, if the industry becomes more efficient. Um, but at the moment, post-COVID, the, the bus industry are finding it very difficult to meet the, the current service demands and the uh, sort of and the government funding and um yeah it's 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 a tricky situation but obviously yeah but lots of people rely on buses and the travel traveling public 
numbers are down still, aren't they, from COVID? Yeah, I believe. there's been a bit of a bounce back, but yeah, it's yeah, still, still down, down. Yeah. from pre-COVID yeah. levels. So we've come to the end of the meeting, but is there anything, the three panellists, is there anything, any point that you wanted to get across which you haven't had a chance to yet? I think I just got mine in. Yeah. <laughs> Georgina? Um, no, not just to say thank you very much for having me. Um, and if you want to talk more about Breathe London, because we love speaking about it, I'm sure me, Kayla and Andrew can hover around. Um, and yeah, thank you. Have a lovely weekend. Um, yeah, I think just thank you for the research. Thank you for all the monitoring data. Thank you for the public awareness increasing. It's all helping, you know, when, from all the projects I've worked on, from ULES to this, it's, you know, it's, it's fantastic. And, um, yeah, pleasure to be here. We weren't looking for thanks, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I think uh, what we need to think about is, um, uh, you know, air, air quality, air pollution, um, but in the context also of sort of one atmosphere. So um, it obviously points to the um, excellent lectures which are going to follow this about um, uh, uh, links and alignment with climate change. Uh, and I think that is unbelievably important. Uh, what that points to for me is really focusing on zero air emission solutions, whether it's from vehicles or from, from buildings. Uh, but that really just deals with the combustion bit. Uh, and we also do need to tackle agriculture, which has had an easy ride uh, for the last 15 years. And that's um, something which we are going to, to have to tackle. Uh, wood burning is, is another area which concerns me, um, uh, which is increasing. And it's the biggest or second biggest source of primary PM 2.5 emissions. Um, and um, Jenny Jones, I, I drafted it for her, uh, about 30 pages of the Clean Air Human Rights Bill. Uh, she happened to top the ballot. It did go through the House of Lords. It's a fantastic piece of legislation. Uh, we're waiting to see what happens in the King's Speech and then in the ballot of private members' bills, um, which will happen after that. Uh, but I think um, uh, uh, enshrining the human right to clean air precisely and explicitly in UK law um, would be a fantastic step forward, um, uh, and I encourage you to support that if you have a moment. But thank you all very much to Frank, uh, all your colleagues, um, and everyone else here today. Tremendous. Thanks. So let us thank the panel. Thank you very much.